right, everybody. We are going to call to order the meeting of the Neshoba Regional School Committee. Um, we will start with our Pledge of Allegiance. So you guys can rise and recite with me. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. This evening we have no public comments. We're going to go uh, past that agenda item and move right on to our consent agenda. This will include the minutes from 426 and the warrants from May 12th. Can I get a motion? Sure. I will move to approve the consent agenda of May 10th, 2023, containing draft mit, uh, meeting minutes of April 26, 2023, and the warrants of May 12th, 2023. Do I have a second? Second. Thanks, Joe. Any discussion on the consent agenda? I do have a Amy. comment in the minutes. Um, I noticed that I was included in the vote on the creation of the OPED advisory committee, but I was not present for that vote. Okay, so, so we can make that adjustment. I think the meeting minutes need to just note that I left um, the meeting right before the personnel subcommittee presentation. Right. So that was a virtual meeting. You had just gotten back from a very long plain flight. Yes. And um, yeah, jumped off in the middle. Yep. All right, is that cool, Lita? Yeah, I got it. Thank you. Any other comments? All right, so uh, with that adjustment included, we will um, hand vote. So everybody in favor, raise your hand. All right, thanks everyone. Thanks, you guys. Next item on the agenda is a school committee chairperson update. And so um, I have but one small update for us all, and that is to, um, well, actually, you know what? I'm going to hold. So I take it back. I don't have any update yet. <laughs> um, I'm going to actually turn it over to our next item on the agenda, and I'm going to give it to Dan Obby. He has a report for us from um, the high school. Hey, Dan. Hello. Uh, so we have a junior prom this weekend at Mechanics Hall. So I think that'll be pretty exciting for them. I remember when, although I didn't go out, I remember last year because that was a thing for us juniors. That was a massive fundraising event as well as social event for everyone to be there. And next week, as well as uh, last week, we have had and are having, sorry, this week, as in tomorrow and the day after, we are finishing up AP testing as well as last week, we had a lot of AP tests, so I can't wait for those to be over. <laughs> uh, and we have MCAS next week, um, and we have a music concert and an art show upcoming. Uh, we have the Spring Fling Dance on June 2nd, uh, and there's only about two and a half weeks left for seniors, the final day being May 30th where there'll be a breakfast uh, that morning organized by parents and some of the staff. And we're gonna head outside for like a field day and have some fun events there. So I'm looking forward to that. <laughs> and that'll be all. Awesome. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, Dan. Uh, such a great time of year. But hectic, I'm sure, especially for seniors. Do you guys have any questions for Dan? Anything you want to be wondering about? Um, Dan, I will say that a group of, um, this is the time of year that a lot of students' civic action projects are coming through to fruition, and I know that the school committee has received several emails from your, um, mostly from juniors, I'm pretty sure, asking us to act in various ways. So we really appreciate that, and we want students to know that they can come here during public comment and actually address the school committee directly if they want to. So please feel free to uh, make sure they know that. and. They've also invited us for a sit down, which is kind of a tradition that the school committee started a couple of years back where we would head over to the high school in an organized fashion and the principal would welcome us and we could kind of sit and chat with the high schoolers. So what was going on, what's new? And a, and a group of students asked for that. So I did respond letting them know that if that's something they wanna continue or if they're interested in doing that, that I can come to the high school and certainly any members of the school committee could come and be good listeners without deliberation, of course. Um, so that might happen. So I'm excited about that, and I think that that's something that we should do on a regular, really. Yeah. 
If that happens, Leah, will you be sending an invitation to the school committee members? I can do that. Okay. I can do that. Yeah. I think that sounds like a good I mean, we can talk as a school committee if we want to kind of designate somebody. Maybe it's the, the communication subcommittee who kind of manages that for us, et cetera. But um, it would be nice if we could make that a regular thing. Dan is a great pipeline of information, but if we go to them as well, it might um, uh, build more trust. So, any other questions or comments about the high school? So I will take liberty now to um, uh, use my chairperson report to kind of uh, thank Dan for all of his service. I think Dan, this is your second year, right? Yeah. That you've been coming to these meetings, you've been reporting for us, and we're super grateful to you. And we actually have a gift <laughs> that uh, we'd like to give to you. So I'm going to walk it down the aisle here. Sorry, I can lend it now. I don't want you to have one. So, Dan. Okay. Thanks, bud. Thank you. Really appreciate all of your service. Thank you, Dan. So, go no around applause for Dan. So Dan, um, we thank you for coming. I think this will be Dan's last meeting, yeah, um, and we so. wish you the best. All right, thank you. Do you, um, where, can you remind us where you're going next year? Oh, when your gift. Yeah, okay. Okay. I can open it right now if you want. Uh, I'm going to uh, Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. Oh, amazing, that's good for you. All right, what do you got? Let's, Let's see what you got you in here, Dan. It's a copy of the school committee manual. I <laughs> 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 think gets more exciting than that. <laughs> Who informed you? Informed <laughs> <laughs> yeah, somewhere in here. There's an informant down in the back. Yeah, uh, spies, uh, Dan, uh, spies uh, everywhere. Nice. So good luck to you. So we wish you the best. So as riveting as our meetings are, I know that you do like to challenge up probably more important things in your in your world. So, all right, guys. Um. Dan, you can take your name plate if you want it. Oh, thank you. <laughs> the whole thing or just the slide? Whatever, we have time. <laughs> I'm just going to go in your dorm room, my friends. <laughs> <laughs> and then on your CEO desk one day, okay? Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, All right, everybody. So to the main event, um, more or less, we have our superintendent report. So what can you tell us? Thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate that. Um, we have several things to update the committee on tonight. If I may ask the chair's favor, in the event that our WCSA scholar Michelle Nguyen uh, would come in the room, that we'll reintroduce that part of the report in our presence. Um, because I've noted that I'm technically not on until 7:10, so it could be that, Ooh, got it. That, that may be the reason why. So, but in that event, um, uh, I'll share with the committee. Um, I have in here uh, a copy of the communication that I sent out to the school system last week. Uh, notifying our school district that our director of pupil per, uh, personnel services, Joan DeAngelis, has accepted a position in another district. And we wholeheartedly want to thank Joan for her time, her service, her dedication to the show the school district, and for bringing the fabulous programs that we have in our district, working with our educators and families, um, and all the good things that, that uh, she was able to, to do for, for us here in the show. So we're, we're very grateful. Um, it is May, however. And um, just as uh, I, I shared with the committee in postponing the center school search, we're going to go through an interim process to look for um, our new PPS director. And that's going to afford us time to really do a deep dive, do a deep, deep dive into the services, uh, special uh, student services department, pupil personnel services, <laughs> the department that has a different name in every school system that you go to. Right? Mm -hmm. um, but we'll be conducting focus group conversations, stakeholder surveys. Uh, we're going to use that information to develop search criteria, design a thoughtful process that attracts high quality candidates, um, conduct interviews, do the vetting, and ultimately select the best candidate for Neshoba. Uh, we're going to be able to get a, a good jump early on in the year and be able to have our posting out there for an extensive period of time to gather a large pool of candidates. So uh, we'll look forward to that system. Most of all, as you all learned through the entry process last year, I found great value and gained so much from interacting with the community and hosting the conversations. So in a similar fashion, we'll be conducting those conversations and um, we'll be updating the committee uh, as we go. I will remind the chair that uh, this is a position 
that uh, does get consideration of the school committee in terms of conf a confirmation vote uh, based on the recommendation of the superintendent. So uh, when we do have an interim director position come forward, I will let you know uh, so that we can put that uh, recommendation on to the agenda. Okay. Um, next, uh, in your packets, you have the Aspet Valley Collaborative Update Number Three. This uh, update is on the established rates that the uh, ABC Board recently took on um, uh, the programs and services provided by Aspet Valley. So, it's presented in the memo there. Of which uh, I would point out in terms of the programs for students that attend Aspet Valley Collaborative, uh, there's four percent increases across the programs with a 6.73 and a 6.72 increase in the two SOAR programs. Um, and so uh, these are for your consideration. I will tell you that the board uh, vetted this through carefully uh, with the director and uh, voted uh, unanimously to approve it on last board meeting. This is not something we have control over. This is nothing we have control over. Um, we are required by uh, the state of Massachusetts to by the fact that we're a member to a collaborative group to give four reports to the school committee on the workings of, of that collaborative. And so this is three of the four reports. So you'll get an end of the year summary report from ABC as well. Questioning? Um, yeah, I'm just trying to figure out how this affects us. So the 4% increase is an increase in cost that, to our district. Yes for students to go out of, receive services out of district. Yeah. Okay. So it's, it's an increase in the tuition rate. So if we have a student, for instance, placed in the, uh, um, I'll pick one here, the OSA member uh, class, the tuition rate for that student actually will go up by 4%. So there's no direct impact uh, in terms of any action that we have to take here. It's <coughs> information only, really. Okay. Okay. Um, with that, I am going to take a moment to uh, recognize our outstanding student, Ms. Michelle Nguyen of Neshoba Regional High School, as the uh, Worcester County Superintendent's Association Scholar Award. She's been an outstanding student at Neshoba Regional High School. And I'll just read a piece here. And uh, this was taken from some of the uh, comments that were made regarding her references and nomination uh, for that award. So join me in celebrating. Uh, Michelle Nguyen as Neshoba Regional High School's WCSA Scholar Award recipient. Michelle is a dedicated learner who has excelled in and out of the classroom. Having earned a five on the AP Chemistry exam, Michelle has balanced a full workload of AP courses and extracurriculars to become a well-rounded student. She is committed to robotics, dance, and teaches piano in her spare time. Her guidance counselor describes her as a natural leader, driven and resilient, outgoing and friendly. We're proud to have Michelle represent our school system as the WCSA Scholar Award recipient. Congratulations, Michelle. So we can give her some applause. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Chair, again, I will ask if, if uh, you would afford me the opportunity to do that again in the event that uh, Michelle arrives later in the agenda. Um, uh, next, um, I think uh, we're going to skip forward maybe to the open uh, Syed. Uh, uh, update on strategic work before we uh, discuss the structured learning time at Neshoba Regional High School. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to our Assistant Superintendent Friend for both of those items. So Ms. Friend, can you uh, begin with Open Syed? Sure, we're very excited to share with the committee that we have received another competitive grant to support our curriculum and instruction efforts here at Neshoba. Uh, I alluded to this, uh, I believe, in our last committee meeting, but we are pleased to share that we have received a grant from the Open Sighted Equitable Instruction Initiative at Boston College in the amount of $23,700. And the grant funding will support our implementation of um, Open Sighted, which truly is a hands-on experiential phenomenon-based instruction and curriculum, which we're excited to implement six through eight in all of our schools beginning next year. Uh, the grant funding will support professional development and durable equipment costs associated with implementing Open Syed. Uh, in addition, our, our participants and our teachers will be able to receive priority access to in-state workshops and additional professional learning resources and student programming offered through Open Syed Equitable Instruction Initiative based at the Lynch School at BC. 
We're excited about uh, implementing this curriculum. It's really where we want to be with our instruction as it relates to middle school science and high school science and elementary science. It is a constructive, constructivist approach to learning, and we're excited to bring our high school department chair, Linda Peer, into the conversation about what learning is looking like at the middle level as we step into the curriculum review cycle for science at the high school beginning next year. So we're excited about this grant opportunity and what it means for us in terms of learning and student experience at the middle level and where it will take us. I know that Mr. Mulcairn has been working on a template for the school committee to consider um, the review and acceptance of our grants, and I think that this particular grant will will be a tryout and a run for that new template at our next meeting. Is that accurate? Yeah, the, the template has been shown to the budget board subcommittee, uh, but we'll bring it forward as the actual meeting materials and new business at the next meeting. Super. Thank you, Ms. Friend. Um, and if you will, if we can go on to uh, the um, structured learning time for initial regional high school. And I want to invite uh, Dr. Kate Bolton to the presentation table, along with Assistant Superintendent Friend, uh, to review with this committee um, the work on structured learning time. Uh, I will set this up by saying okay. currently. Um, the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education is conducting a coordinated program review of the district. It's a year-long process. We actually had our final interview review today uh, from the site visit that has been conducted this week. Um, and we should be getting that report sometime September-ish for our consideration. Um, one of the things in that is self-reporting based upon the standards. And in that self-report, uh, we identified that uh, we needed to look at the structured learning time in the Shoulder Regional High School and review that uh, because currently we aren't meeting the requirements of 990 minutes. We need the requirement in the state statute of 180 days. But at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Boynton and Ms. Friend uh, for their presentation, and um, we'll go from there. Okay. So thank you, thank you for the opportunity uh, to share our structured learning time update with the committee for consideration as, as, uh, as it relates to some implications for scheduling um, and for the calendar as well. So uh, a deep gratitude to Dr. Boynton for her efforts to dig into uh, the situation along with the high school guidance department um, and your staff yes. in, the, in the office as well. So thank you for all of your thank efforts. You. Um, we are uh, looking forward to sharing with you what we've discovered um, as a result of our internal audit and exploration of the current state of the schedule. Uh, there are many factors, as the superintendent had alluded to, as to the why, which we are prepared to share with you. Uh, we are also prepared to share with you a short-term mitigation strategy to actually exceed compliance, Correct. which we reviewed with Desi today, um, and, and ha they have shared with us that if implemented, we would exceed um, the compliance requirements, so we did have that meeting with them this afternoon. And as well, um, a long-term strategy uh, to not only meet compliance, but really to help um, support the vision we've articulated as it's outlined in our strategic plan for learning and the kinds of learning experiences we want our students to experience at the high school, that our efforts with our long-term plan are really intended to support those efforts. And so we're excited to share those with you as well because they really do support our vision for learning and where we want to be at the high school level. So I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Boynton, and we'll try not to interrupt, but... Interrupt away. <laughs> um, Thank you all for having us uh, here to, to talk about this issue. Alita, next slide, please. Scroll down there. Um, so Massachusetts requires all public high schools to have a minimum of 990 structured learning hours for students each year. Passing time, lunch, homeroom, and non-directed study don't count towards this time. Um, it falls under Massachusetts law 603 CMR. 27 student learning time regulations that um, came about in the 1990s. 
Um, to determine structured learning hours, schools calculate the total amount of time um, during the school day and then subtract the non-instructional hours. And then there's an additional calculation as well that subtra uh, subtracts the learning hours lost due to late starts or early release time during the year. So it's a multi-step process to uh, really th then determine um, structured learning time. Next slide, Alita, please. So the uh, Neshoba Regional High School structured learning time findings um, through our own internal scheduling audit as well as the DESE tiered focused monitoring review, review process that both Laura and Kirk mentioned, um, we did discover that Neshoba Regional High School is out of compliance with structured learning time. Um, there are several factors. Um, when, we, when we did um, sort of a, a deep dive in historically um, that have contributed to this shortfall. Um, we have variability in credit-bearing classes that naturally create gaps in students' schedules. Um, those could be semester classes, those could be science labs, and there's nothing that offsets those, um, the, the, those variable classes creating a hole in a student's schedule. Our seven period <coughs> days without drops um, is a complicating factor in, in terms of um, how our rotation works um, and then not allowing for fewer, fewer classes um, to, to take place during a, a particular school day. Um, we did find a reduction from the 25 uh, to 23 credits as the minimum number of credits um, to be considered a fully enrolled student as a compli complicating factor in increasing the number of study halls as well. Um, we do have time lost to late starts and early releases. Um, time lost to passing time and lunch, and perhaps the biggest one, and, and all of this really contributes to study halls, uh, is, is the, the existence of study halls for our grades 10 through 12 students. Our grade 9 students are in compliance with 990, with the directed study, the freshman study skills. Um, next slide. Here's how um, the current conditions and how um, how we calculated those. So we take a look at the school day, which is six hours and 40 minutes. That um, calculates out to 400 minutes per day. In red is the um, non-instructional time. So passing time is 24 minutes, lunch is 23. Study halls are 46. Um, we calculate every student on average has one study hall every single day. That's 93 minutes a day of non-instructional time. So right off the bat, you can see, when we go down to the calculations, um, the total time and hours per year, uh, we already fall um, below the 990 with that calculation. And then we had to additionally subtract those late starts and early releases for an additional 44 hours. Um, we landed 877 hours. We are 113 hours short. That's a lot. Um, and that's with the 23 credits minimum. Um, what I would say is that Students enrolled in 23 credits are meeting, if they pass all their classes, they are meeting our graduation requirements. Um, so that's not in, in, um, in consideration or, or in danger here at all, but it's the 990 um, that uh, I think the 23 credits uh, contributes to that along with the other factors that I just mentioned. Alita, would you mind uh, going to the next slide? Here is the short-term mitigation plan. So our school day will not change. It will be six hours and 40 minutes, four, 400 minutes a day. We will continue to have 24 minutes of passing time, um, really to allow students to be able to get from one end of the building to another. It is a sprawling, uh, it is a sprawling building, and, and we looked at shortening passing time. It's simply not feasible, um, and it doesn't really get us to where we need to be anyway. Um, lunch at 23 minutes, we're not changing that. However, we are going to implement a directed study model for all grades, which will then eliminate um, the, those 46 minutes of non-instructional time every single day, um, bringing us to 47 non-instructional minutes per day between passing time and lunch. Um, and that um, brings us to 1,059, if I can read that far, 1,059 hours. And then um, we are, in, in, I think, in good faith, um, eliminating or requesting to eliminate the PLT late starts on the high school side of things to give us a nice cushion where we then um, go to 32 hours um, of lost learning time for um, late starts for exams as well as our early release professional development time um, per the district and that brings us to 1027 hours 37 hours over 
the time on learning, um, structured learning time requirements. Um, um, we have uh, additional proposals as well to increase the minimum number of credits back up to 25. Um, we're proposing as well to eliminate our late start PLT times. None of the other schools have that, so that brings us in line with the calendar for the other schools. Um, and then, again, implementing the directed study model for all grades, and currently this model exists for ninth grade. And we believe with, with the sort of the, the, the floor lifted back up to 25, we can, um, we can support a directed study model for all grades. Um, next slide. Oh, do you want to add? I like yeah, to go for it. I just wanted to add that uh, the implementation of the directed studies will really work to support what MTSS can, can look like at the high school, providing students with direct access to teachers during the directed study halls for Tier 1 and Tier 2 support. So if they need extra help, they have access to a teacher in a small group setting. Um, so that's exactly it. Um, an additional outcome of that. As well, we've also explored the possibility of piloting um, independent studies, um, potentially, um, as an option or as an example, as an option for students who may be under-enrolled for juniors and senior, seniors as we work to uh, implement our vision for learning at the high school to provide students with options to explore interests of, of study. Correct. So we're talking about that as well. Correct. Um, this is a, a short-term mitigation strategy. Really, the long-term solution um, has to be much more substantial. Um, it, the short-term solution gets us above the 990 structured learning hours, um, but in line with our, our um, strategic plan and the types of learning that we want um, for our students, learning opportunities, uh, exploring a long-term and sustainable solution involved, uh, really truly involves in changing, changing how we fundamentally structure our school day. So this includes bell schedule change, as well as an examination and possible adjustment to graduation requirements, which we would partner with you on. Um, and in alignment with our strategic plan timeline, a new schedule will be explored over the next 12 to 18 months for adoption in the 25-26 school year, along with other programmatic changes to support our educational vision and then further provide a scheduling framework that supports innovation and learner engagement as outlined in our strategic plan. So really viewing this as an opportunity to really deeply look in at, at what we do and how we structure our day and what we value and what are the learning experiences that we want for our students. Next slide. So next steps, um, spring of 23, short-term adjustments proposed and implemented. Um, spring, uh, also spring of 23, uh, creation of a scheduled exploratory working group. I shared this presentation with my staff at the staff meeting last week for feedback, and then also sent out a survey, um, of an interest survey to join the, the exploratory working group. I've had really wonderful response, so that working group will get off the ground and up and running um, this spring. Um, beginning that and then spring into fall um, of, of the next school year um, we'll be looking at um, sharing scheduling models with cost-benefit analysis um, seeking feedback um, there's going to be multiple iterations coming back to this group and sharing um, updates as appropriate uh, based on staff and student feedback we'd like to bring then a preferred schedule model to our schedule committee per uh, as outlined in the contract um, <coughs> And then fall, winter of 24, um, share the preferred schedule model and any programming adjustments to all of you. Uh, and then from uh, really beginning earlier than this, but much more formally, um, winter into the, the summer of 25, begin preparation for the new schedule implementation for the 25-26 school year. And that would include any changes to the handbook, any changes to the program of studies, and continued professional development for our staff. Uh, Alita, next slide, please. And communication plan, um, today I'm presenting, uh, Laura and I are presenting to all of you, um, to the school committee uh, on Friday. Uh, I'll be sending a memo via email to the Neshoba Regional High School community about the structured learning hours compliance um, with the short-term mitigation plan, as well as the long-term plan for structural change. Over this summer, communication will be sent out to students and families about the structure and expectations for our supported or directed studies. 
and that ongoing continued communication to this this body as well as the Neshoba Regional High School community um, about the progress uh, and developments um, that take place towards the long-term structural change, uh, and that would be during uh, next year and then the following school year as well. And Alita, next slide, which I think is the final slide. Yep, final slide. Um, next steps for the Neshoba Regional High School staff. Uh, we are formulating a scheduled exploratory working group that will get up and running by the end of this month and will work from May 2023, basically through the spring of 24 and beyond as needed. We'll um, establish uh, an internal, more robust timeline. And then May of 2023, this was the suggestion of one of our staff members to formulate a directed or supported study working group. And this group um, already, uh, is already um, being formulated as well, and they'll work in the, the spring and summer of this year to develop um, directed study expectations and protocols to be able to roll out at the end of the summer and share with staff as well um, as we implement the directed study model next school year. And with that, do you want to add anything else? Thank you very much. We'll take questions on the chair. Okay, so <clears throat> why don't we delegate our questions to this portion of the superintendent's report and then after this is concluded, yeah. we'll go back to other parts of the superintendent's report. So on structured learning time, uh, questions, Scott? Well, so it looks like your solution for the next two years is to replace study hall with directed study. Correct. Can you explain what directed study is and how it's different from study hall? Absolutely. So um, how DESI kind of describes um, an independent study, if you will, a non-directed study, is that um, students are not working under the supervision of, of a staff member, of a teacher. Um, and uh, a directed study involves uh, some measure of check-in, uh, some measure of uh, perhaps some direct instruction. It doesn't have to be a lot of direct instruction. Um, it could be cueing students to um, to take a look at their um, at their at their um, Google at their Google classrooms. It could be um, providing resources around executive functioning and helping students um, plan and work on a long-term project. That's really the, the purview of, of this working group to establish those expectations. Our freshman study skills class, um, Mr. Emerson teaches the freshman study skills. Uh, we'll be basing it on that model um, and he provides, excuse me, some direct instruction around um, goal setting or organization or planning for long-term projects um, uh, at the beginning of the class, and then students begin, um, after that direct, you know, direct instruction, students then begin um, and, and apply what, what, he's, what he's learned. He also helps them manage um, and uh, learn self-advocacy -adv skills, communicating with their teachers as well. So that's the, that's the difference where there is some direct oversight from an adult versus the other version that currently exists, there is not. Teachers are taking attendance and monitoring for safety, and that's about it. So will it require any additional staff? No. No. We will be using every unit A member um, for, for this directed study. It will be quite a lift. Um, however, we, we can believe we absolutely can staff this with the current staffing that we have. The credit requirement shifting from 23 to 25 is a key element in that because that's the algorithm by which it makes this yes. possible. Um, because then when you increase those and the students are in assigned classes and then you're available teachers that are not in there assigned five courses are then available. So the math works out in that way. Whereas currently we can't execute that strategy. So for some context for members who are relatively new, in the fall of 21, if you guys were on the committee, which some of you were, the high school administration, none of which are currently employed by the district anymore, um, asked us to reduce the credit total to 23. It was 25. And we, um, I think they did not recognize this potential unintended consequence of students because they didn't have to take as many classes, they were gonna enroll more study halls. And so I saw your chart is calculating students, this is based on the assumption that students take one study hall, but my son has two. Yes, 
So we have students, um, if, you're, if you're enrolled in 23, you have 1.5 studies. So sometimes you'll have two, sometimes you'll have one. If you are, if a student is enrolled in 28, which is the ceiling, they have no studies. Yeah. And so we have a range of students. Jesse says if, 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 you know, if one cohort of students doesn't meet time on learning, the entire school doesn't meet time on learning. So, um, and so I just wanted to say that um, I really appreciate you guys taking this bull by the horns because this is not a new thing. Um, it's been exacerbated by our vote in the fall of 21. But these non-directed studies have existed at Neshoba for a long time. So um, moving in the direction of eliminating this time that students are spending during the day is, is important. I would just say that in the new schedule consideration, as you start to investigate options, that I would want to see still some time during the day where the kids are engaged in this directed study work. Because if you're going to revamp the schedule, you don't want, and you, of course, we want a rigorous experience for our kids. I don't want kids to be worked to the wall yes. Yes. under a new schedule. And, you know, I know that the educators at the table recognize that hitting pause in the day and giving kids access to their teachers is beyond necessary in this really frantic world that we have created. So I appreciate you doing this short-term mitigation strategy to eliminate the problem that currently exists. You are gonna ask us to vote at the next meeting to raise the credit total for next year? That's correct. You have two requests? Two, I have two requests, actually. The one is to um, ask you to vote to increase the minimum number of credits to 25. And then the second request is to um, allow, allow uh, I guess, a, a change in the calendar um, to reflect the, the elimination of the, PL, the late start PLT time at the high school. Both of which will happen at the next meeting. Okay. Correct. Uh, other questions, Amy? Yeah, I, I actually have two questions on both of those areas. So I, I think what I'm hearing you say is that by increasing the credit requirements, students will enroll more courses, eliminating the study halls. But now I have a concern that Leah has expressed that there won't be any um, guarantee that students will have time in their schedules for the directed studies, which I think they will. They will. Yes, they will. So I've I've worked with with Jody uh, Specht actually on on this, our our guidance director, and um, some of our students by by choice will have 28 credits, and those are students who have already signed up for 28, and they by choice they're fully fully scheduled. If a student has 25, 26, or 27 credits. There, is, there will be time and space within their schedule for a directed study. It might be every other day for a semester, or it might be every day. So, that the, so any, any student who has 25, 26, or 27 will have a directed study of some sort. So as a parent, it's important to understand that, because um, I don't think I appreciated that. Um, as a parent, as my student was moving through Neshoba, because I've had students, my kids have been in the situation of not having any time in their schedule for um, wellness or for study halls, which would now be directed studies. And so I think it's, it's good to make sure that parents understand that 25 seems to be the sweet spot that would allow them to have some of that free time um, or directed study time. Um, so I just want to make sure that that message gets out what, to eighth graders coming up through the high school. Yep. Um, naturally, with the 25 credit minimum, um, all of our tenth and, um, ninth and 10th graders, because of how the health and wellness credits work out, they have 26 credits because of how the health and wellness credits work out. Um, and that um, amounts to um, a schedule up basically every other day for the year. They have a direct a direct, yeah, it, in, for freshmen, it would be the freshman study skills, which is a direct study. Um, my next question had to do with the late starts. So are you recommending only eliminating late starts that also served as PLT time, Correct. but, but um, keeping the ones for that exams. are for like exam weeks? Yes. Okay. Um, and then my, um, there was another, oh, the freshman study skills class is, I think that because my daughters have been taking too many credits, 
they missed that class as a freshman. So I'm wondering if you're going to be taking a look at reorganizing um, available directed study time, if there's a way to ensure that every student gets access to that class. Because I think, I think that's part of the long-term um, yeah. structural shifts. Many, many schools have moved to a wind block or a flex block model that, that allows for that, and I, I think that is certainly something I'm interested in exploring um, at the high school, that regardless of the number of credits that you're in, on a win or a flex day, there is that time built in for um, extension of learning, for extra support, for guidance seminars um, as well. So definitely something that yeah, I'm interested in looking at that model that would universally support all of our students. And I also just, I, know, I don't want to take up too much more time, but I really want to thank you for sharing the data just, you know, um, and being, um, uh, what's the right word? Transparent. transparent. I hate to use that word, but being transparent, it's, it's appreciated. So, thank you. Thank you. No, I think this was important. I'm just going to, to maybe um, really some of your concern from the communication questions. We can adapt the letter to a run in the common this week as well. So Ms. Friend can Absolutely. make sure that we get that into the common. Thank that you. way the system knows. Any other questions about this, John? <coughs> Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, my question is not necessarily directed regarding educational instruction, but I did find it interesting that when Dr. Boynton was presenting, she used the word students working with their instructors. And I also heard the chair mention the word work in regard to directed studies. And in that in mind, I, it, I find it curious that in, in 2023, we're only affording 23 minutes for lunch for our students. Mm -hmm. And I, I find it particularly interesting given that the Fair Labor Division of the Commonwealth mandates a minimum of 30 minutes mm -hmm. for any laborer who works a minimum of six hours. So as educators, how do we square that? I mean, it, it seems 23 minutes seems like a really short period of time for kids to get into the cafeteria, get their lunch, eat, and then get back to class. So I'm not looking to you know make any issue with this, but I just was curious as to what you think as educators about that period of time period. 23 if minutes I, is so yeah. it's fine. Having to lunch duty. Yes. Uh, in, in, in my previous <laughs> life, I brought up that exact same issue no. <laughs> as we were examining uh, lunch times. It's one of these things that is a historical practice that goes back decades that came out of some reference material from I don't even know which government body of recommendation of 22 minutes of lunch per day would be required for students. And it's actually a standard that then was applied across the country. So I searched and searched like, where is this found in statute? Where is this? Can't find it. <laughs> and it, w it, but it's been established as a regular practice all across the country. Not to say there isn't exceptions to that, but I've had the same question myself um, about that. And so the fact of the matter is when we look at what our time on learning requirements are and what our bell to bell schedules are with the Department of Education, it is the math by which we can have lunch and still meet the learning requirements of 990 hours and 180 days. Um, Expanding that would mean we would have to expand the workday. Expanding the workday would mean we'd have to expand the salary contracts, which means there would have to be negotiations. And so it, it would be very much a, a prolonged and laborious process to ultimately get there. But I have not been able to find any type of federal or state standard to that, but it is just accepted as the common practice. That doesn't include passing time, right? 23 minutes. And so for the employees, it's actually longer because the kids leave. They have three or four minutes to get down to the calf, and then they have three or four to get back. So the employees, I think, technically have approximately 30. Mm -hmm. All the teachers in the room are laughing because it's yeah, speedy. They, and yeah, 30 minutes. Yeah. 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 I would, may I just add, um, we've talked quite a bit about the pace of the day mm -hmm. um, and what that looks like for students and learning and always um, moving so quickly. From, from one period to another period, and I know that that's an element that's going to be tackled uh, with the scheduling working group, but really providing students with an opportunity to get into the flow um, and um, have time to dig in uh, with their learning is an element that I know will be explored with the scheduling working group. So 
slowing down the day so that students can dig into their learning and moving away from a traditional schedule that's really from the industrial model of moving from one period to another period to another period is something that I know Dr. Boynton has already begun discussing with her staff and will be part of uh, part of the exploration. Part of the exploration, and and so that maybe it won't fe feel uh, so maddening in, in terms of moving from one yep. one bit to another. I think we had a couple other questions, Karen. Mm -hmm. um, first, since students have already registered for their classes, mm -hmm. for students who are registered for twenty three, how is that going to be? All students um, had to in the in the registration or the course sign-up process, had to pick uh, several elective options, okay. their first and second. So counselors um, will be going in and taking a look. I think, given the presentation, I think that work started behind the scenes today, like this week, just to take a look and see what were those, um, you know, second or third mm -hmm. elective options, and then and by by signing up for one additional elective you then, the student go, goes immediately from, uh, electives are typically one semester, so the students will, will go immediately from 23 to 25 and looking at sprinkling students around it in their second or third elective choice. Second, preferable. Um, my question is about um, eliminating the, the late starts for PLT. I, I'm not entirely familiar with the Michelle PLT model. Um, but from what I understand, the late starts um, represent a really good percentage of opportunities for PLTs to convene. So I guess my question is, uh, two questions related to that. Number one, what other opportunities remain for PLTs to convene? And then will we take, um, will we be able to take advantage of the opportunity to revisit our schedule to incorporate more consistent PLT convening? Yeah, those are good questions. and, and Several years ago, uh, several principals ago, the PLT time at Neshoba Regional High School was 12 mornings, um, and then reduced down to the current six that we have now. And they're not um, organized in traditional professional learning community um, structure. Um, they are de really department-based and um, often either curriculum development or it's in, in a high interest area. They're quite valuable, but they, they're not focused in on student learning like traditional PLCs are. Um, and so I know that this is something that through our multi-tiered multi systems of support, um, through our strategic plan that we're looking to develop and get training in as a district. And I absolutely do see in any long-term schedule the shift that we, um, that we create, um, that we do our, our very best to once we then get um, onboarded with the, the PLC structure uh, that we have time in the day for, for staff to meet in, in those traditional PLCs. Um, the, the PLT time is, is very valuable for our staff, but it's not student-centered PLCs. If that makes I, sense. I know that this is a projection, but um, is the expectation to exceed the current number of meeting opportunities from six to maybe a more regular meeting schedule? I believe that, yes. Great. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So I feel like that might have been all the questions, but last call. All right, can we thank Dr. Boynton and Ms. Friend for their presentation and all their efforts there? Really, really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. You. Thank you for support. Thank you so much. Um, to the committee, the superintendent's report had a couple of other items prior to this. Any questions on those things? Getting back to this. In the ADC report, there were a couple of acronyms. I was wondering if you could tell me what those acronyms mean. Oh, boy. Like SOAR, <laughs> SOAR and OMA, I think, were the two. The, yeah, these are, and forgive me, I can't remember off the top of my head. These OSA. are the specialized, the OSA, these are the specialized program for intensive needs programming for students. Uh, that, that require um, uh, very small class sizes, nurse supports in some cases um, for students with severe disabilities. Which I is just, so forgive me if I, if I can't recall the, the OSA at the second. What does it stand for? Orchard Street Academy. I just looked it up. Thank you. The okay. Orchard Street Academy. What does SOAR stand for? Thank you. It's yes. a different school. Okay. Yeah. 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 It's so not all the programs are housed at the ABC facility. They actually leave spaces from. Um, Algonquin in, in mm -hmm. another location. Okay, thank you. All right.
righty. So seeing no further questions about the superintendent's report, we are ready to move on. Um, so on to new business, everyone. Uh, the student handbook for FY23-24 is going to be presented to us. <laughs> I've been done with it. Go right back to the table. But I'll let the superintendent tee it up a little bit. Yes, absolutely. As part of the coordinated program review, that gives a chance to so deep lead our student handbooks as well. As part of the self-assessment process, a real focus in our coordinated program review issue is on in the area of civil rights. So there are lots of civil rights areas that we have to look at and work on, calibrate our um, handbooks all across the district. Um, this is the handbook that is required for the school committee approval ultimately on. Um, we will present all the handbooks to our committee, uh, but we're meeting that requirement. With that, I'll introduce Thank Dr. Boyton once again. Thank you for having me back. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm Nancy. Well, um, so this, uh, uh, yeah, through the uh, DESE tiered focus monitoring review process, uh, I had several meetings with, uh, with Laura, with Joan, and our DESE counterpart. Um, to get feedback about required elements uh, for our handbook. And, and if you take a look at last year's or this current year's handbook and next year's, the, the, page, the pe you know, page numbers are vastly increased. It went from 70 something pages to I think 114 pages um, because there were requ required elements that we, that we needed to add. <coughs> item number one, um, I need to update, uh, to, I guess, correct on that. I did not add the federal and state regulations and the appendices, I ended up creating a separate section for the, the full text. And the feedback from the Department of Education was to include the full text of those um, state and federal regulations, not hyperlinks to the text online. And so that's what that reflects. And that was probably the biggest increase in the pagination. So it's not in the appendices. They have their own separate set, um, section. Um, so I then removed those external, any external hyperlinks to any of those regulations per Jesse recommendation. Um, we were missing um, a lot of protected category language in um, with, with really sprinkled throughout the handbook, but in particular in our um, our bullying, our harassment, Title IX, Title VI. Um, so I added um, categories for um, inc that is inclusive of all groups. In our discipline process, I added language regarding the school's responsibility to educate students um, as part of the due process for suspension, um, and then also added um, the educational service plan and re revised that, more information about the educational service plan. So if a student is suspended, they are um, guaranteed an education, and we need to explain how we're providing that education. Um, for our discipline process, um, I deleted the former language uh, around, specifically around suspensions. We have a restorative, restorative justice approach at Neshoba, um, but the, our suspension language um, really did not reflect the changes that DESE had um, in Massachusetts has made in the law. And so I added the DESE model language there um, from the February 2023 update on suspension procedures. Um, <coughs> Some small revisions in the section on di disciplining students uh, with disabilities to align with DESE and MASS requirements, again, with the change in the law from November and then the, the updates from this February. Um, added language about uh, MASS CR 25 and ensured bullying language is uh, aligned across documents. Um, and again, cross reference the, the word our, our DESE representative used was to make sure that that language is triangulated um, across all of the documents um, that the district. Um, has, uh, and I know there were re revisions made also to the positive climate plan. Um, we needed to include required definitions within the bullying policy. Um, we did not have contact information for investigations under Title, um, title IX, Title VI, and harassment, so I added that contact information, those titles. Um, we did not have um, enough language around um, restraint policies and procedures, uh, and those you'll see in all of the handbooks. So we added those, and Joan was a tremendous help with that section as well. Um, updated non-discrimination um, statement. I did delete language describing study halls because those will mm -hmm. no longer be relevant. Um, and then uh, the last change is continuing to review the handbook for formatting, spelling, and grammatical errors. Um, and I filled in school council uh, about the changes. Um, the school council um, has been working um, 
very hard on the handbook, but focusing in on, on the attendance policy. Um, we're going to continue that, but not propose any more changes for next year relative to attendance. That just will allow us time to continue that work. Um, and so that's the handbook. Thanks, Kate. Thank you. Any questions about these changes? We will be asked to take a vote next meeting. Okay. And one thing that I would add is, is I think um, the minimum number of credits does appear in the handbook. So I, if school, school committee approves that change, um, is there a, a separate motion that would have to, because it's the 23 credits that exists here in the, this handbook, because that hasn't been voted yet. For formality, Madam Chair, excuse me. Yes, sir. Um, for formality's sakes, we actually could take a vote on the high school handbook two meetings from now um, and go through the procedures of the recommended vote on um, the, the credit changes. And that way it'd just be in procedural order. But I leave that to the. I think we could also take chair. the credit vote first and then just vote an amended handbook. Okay. Two seconds later. Whatever your pleasure same, is. I think same meeting is best. Getting it taken care of for Kate. Okay. 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 And the, the expectation is once it's approved, um, it, it will be uploaded onto the website and the, the deadline June 1st um, is the preferred deadline from, from DESE for the updated handbook to be uploaded. That's what we said. Yep. And we have a meeting on the 31st, but it's reserved for our joint SBC meeting, so we want to keep that agenda tight. So I think we can probably do both next meeting. But any questions on the handbook or anything that you see that you think is... Um, I had a question. I, I have a, so forgive me, Dr. Boyne. Number one, it says added the full text of state and federal regulations in the appendices. Which state and federal regulations are you adding to the appendices? But if, can I t grab my laptop and I can Certainly. pull that open? Well, that's not my question. Sorry. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's, that's the chance. Please do. Please do. Uh, so things like oh, uh, okay. 37H, 37H and a half, 37H and three quarters. Um, and Kate, you did say that that is the one change is that you no longer have it in the appendices. Correct. They are their own the section. Of the handbook. They're their own section. Which I can see in the table of contents. Yeah, it's listed in the table of contents. And so these are like mandated reporter pieces. Um, oh, there it is. Perfect. Balling. Due process. DYS. Due process. And due process for kids. Dr. Do you know what section it is? Just keep, uh, keep scrolling down. I think it's 13. There we go. Yep. Uh, so yes, uh, Mass General Law, Chapter 71, Section 37H, 37H and a half, three quarters, um, 37G, 37O, IDEA. There's a ton. So yeah, they're all listed there. I, I apologize, I didn't see yeah. that. I was just looking at the memorandum. Yeah. Um, my other follow-up question was regarding, the, are you talking about Mass, mass Code, of, uh, Code of Masters Regulations, CMR? Which which section are you? I think that's in there as well. Six oh three CMR twenty eighth is uh, re related to the Individuals with Di Disabilities Education Act. I'm sorry. What it said C, uh, on your memo? You had C. Mass. I, I can't remember what it said on the memorandum. And that. that one is around uh, bullying, the bullying statute. Mm -hmm. CR 25. 25 is the bullying statute. Yeah, so the CMR are federal regulations, right? No, the Code of Massachusetts regulations, CMR. Well, C what's CR? Well, I assume, it, I assume you meant code, the, the abbreviation is CMR, Code of Massachusetts, code of Massachusetts regulations. regulations. Okay, so what you're talking about is CMR 630, Section 25? Because you said, the memo just says MACR 25. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I can I can amend that. I, I was looking no, I'm just at, at my notes from when we met with with uh, our Desi representative back in. Yeah. What's that? A syntactical yep. error. So it's just number nine. Just number nine. No, I, I okay. Just so I'm clear. So here, the the let me go back to the to the memo for one second. Hold on. I think I made a a, 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 a grammatical or a technical. Error in the memo. This is the memo. I have it. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. So go down to number nine. Yeah, number nine, MACI 25. So what you're really referring to, just so my own education, is 
630 CMR, Section 25. Yes, that's all I need. Thank you very much. Apologies. Mike? This is more of a question for the superintendent, and this is just out of curiosity. Is, is the um, expectation as a, as a matter of business in the district to revisit handbooks on an annual basis or on an as-needed basis? I believe it's an annual basis for high schools. For high school. Yeah. Yeah, yeah by regulation. Okay. And is the high school handbook the only one that you are that you need to get a school committee vote on? Correct. And so we bring those forward to you. Uh, we did that this time last year across the system. Neshoba has historically only brought the high school handbook. I, as a superintendent, thought it would be important that our committee have looked at all the handbooks. So I brought all of them forward with the high school email requirement. Okay. And so. Forgive me, the other handbooks are something we're going to look at next meeting. Um, I don't know if we're looking at those next meeting. Uh, the urgency around presenting this today is in our coordinated program review. We wanted to make sure that we have things buttoned down for the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. But those will be coming forward from the committee shortly. And, and they're all ready. They're ready to go. And those come through the school councils. That's their main function, is the yeah. handbook and setting the improvement plans. We are meeting with our principals tomorrow, so we'll make sure that they've had a chance to review them with their school councils to give them that courtesy, of course. Okay. Thank you again, Dr. Boyd. Okay. Right. One last quick question. One. Sure. Thank you, Madam Chairman. So, Dr. Boyd, I'm looking at number four, and I believe you answered this in your presentation. You said that the the added language of the school responsibility to educate students in due process for suspension. I, I believe you articulated that what that means is that there is a requirement on all school districts in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts that if a child is under suspension, that their educational process must continue. And yes. That, okay. Yes. All right. So this has nothing to do with the, the due process attended to a hearing for a suspension? Not for the hearing, but okay. the rights of the student to an education. Right. A further number um, references specifically the due process for hearing, and that's the model language that Desi proposed back in February that, that I have adopted. But that other language has to be in there about the educational service plan, and that, that students are guaranteed an education even when they are suspended, and which is our obligation to provide that. Which is outlined in 37H in that. 37 H and a half and 37 H and three quarters. Wonderful. Thank you so much for that. Thank you all for having me. We appreciate it. Thanks, Kate. All right, everybody. So we're going to move over to the 24-25 um, calendar presentation. As you guys know, a couple of years ago, we decided that we were going to try to approve calendars in two-year periods. Um, so we have already approved the 2324 calendar, which now is going to need a little bit of editing next time around because of those late starts. But what we're going to be looking at now is the proposal for the 2425 uh, calendar, which we would vote on next meeting. Okay, and so Anne Marie is here. Hello, Ms. Stoika. Hello. Hello. Our HR director is here to provide to us um, their proposal. Yes, thank you for the opportunity to offer the proposed calendar for 24-25. I am amazed, you know, that the, um, that the parents in the Neshoba district uh, have the, an eye towards the calendar two years down the road. Unlike at the Stoic House, where I can remember many of the times, wait, today's a half day? <laughs> 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 of course, the further out um, we get the calendar is set, the more likely it is that we're going to need to do a revision. Um, in this calendar, for example, we're going to have a primary election and the town clerks tell us it's either going to be in August, the latter part of August, or it's going to be in September. But that they don't know, they believe it's most likely that it'll be in September, but they don't know yet. Uh, we didn't put it in the calendar because we thought uh, it would be better to later announce an additional day off rather than take back an announced day off in case families might have made plans, you know, to be away or put down deposits or whatever on trips. So uh, if, as is your custom, you have a first meeting tonight, and then vote the next time, which it sounds like that's what you just said. I'll make sure I can be in touch with the town clerks like right before that to see if they've got a got a confirmation on that so that we can edit the calendar before you vote on it. Also, given your earlier discussion tonight, it looks like uh, the superintendent may be asking me to uh, adjust <laughs> this calendar for the yes. non-midterm and uh, 
final uh, professional um, the late starts at the high school. Uh, I'll take my direction from the superintendent, as is always my pleasure. The format on this calendar is similar to the calendar just a short while ago for 23-24. The year will start as usual on uh, the Monday before Labor Day, and we'll start with two days full day professional development for the staff, and then the students will start that Wednesday. The winter, February and April school vacations will be attached to the holidays during those months, and all the holidays are listed in green on the calendar. The seven early release professional development days throughout the year are shown in red. Uh, the, this is interesting, the, uh, the early release student conference in November, it's bright yellow, and the next day is a full day of conferences. As good luck would have it, that's also a voting day. So we're going to be able to have a full a full week of instruction during the month of November, which I know is an interest of the committee with the last calendar. In March, there are two more early release uh, conference days for the students in pre-K to 8, and they're in bright yellow. <coughs> and then the, the uh, high school late starts that will remain will be in, um, uh, in yet, uh, like light purple. And then the individual ones here and there uh, probably won't be on the one that you'll see in a couple of weeks' time. Graduation to the class of uh, 2025 will be on Sunday, June 8th. The last day of school with no snow will be June 13th. Law requires that our calendar uh, contemplate five snow days. If we have all five, our last day gets pushed up from June 13 to June 23. We know that that's more than five, but because of the Juneteenth holiday and the way the weekend, uh, the weekend lies, that's the way that's going to be. Again, this year we have paragraphs below where you see March, April, and May. It's to remind everyone that uh, students who miss school due to cultural or religious observances are afforded the same makeup privileges as people who are uh, students who are out for a, uh, approved absence of illness. And we also again included the link for the comprehensive calendar of observances uh, put out by the Anti-Defamation League. The calendar that you see next time, and probably no one would notice this, is over on the, uh, the high school quarters. We're going to change the the, um, the high school's request to the, sec the end of the second quarter from January 22 to 24, and the end of the third quarter from April 3 to 4. April uh, quarters one and four will remain what you see there. Also, those who have got an eagle eye, we'll notice we've got a duplicate entry for the day off for the pre-K students on January 15th. I think it is. It's at the bottom of the first column and it's at the top of the second column. Um, I'll make that change um, so that it's only listed once. We don't have that colored anything in the big, in the big calendar because that only applies to the pre-K the pre-K students. Always take a minute to thank the calendar committee for, for their work and our town clerks who are infinitely patient and helpful whenever I call them, and I do often for uh, with my questions. So appreciate your consideration for the calendar, and we'll answer any questions that you might have. Great. Thanks, Anne-Marie. You're welcome. That's very good. Uh, Amy. Yeah, I, I've always wondered this. Um, the Lafayette School is typically an early release in elementary schools, in middle schools, but it's not reflected on the calendar. Is that is there a reason why? It just never has been. Is that, is that and I wonder, because I remember where I used to work, where there would be a big display that the school committee would make a uh, you know, would make a vote, oh, let's be magnanimous and have the last day of school be a half day, but it just seems to happen here. Um, it is. I mean, it, it has been every year I've lived here, so. Ms. Kwong, um, we'll take that under advisement and make the change. Okay, thank you. And then I, I my eagle eye caught one <laughs> little typo um, on the, in the paragraph, the first paragraph at the bottom. It says T-H-A-R, and I think it's, uh, Students who are absent as a result of the religious or cultural or oh, yes, will not incur penalties due to. Thank you. Yep. We do our best proofing after we hit send, right? Mm -hmm. She's good too. Oh. She is good. She knows good. Uh, what other questions do you guys have or comments, Mike? Uh, I could be wrong, but I feel as if November fifth, twenty twenty four, is our our presidential election Correct. date. That's right. So it's currently listed as full day for student conferences, no school for students. Is there a conflict there? No, that's actually perfect because the students won't be there. So that the that we're using our buildings for the for the voting 
and they'll be just the, the faculty will be there for that project. Right. Right. So that's a good thing. It's good that it lined up like that. And just as a quick note, uh, if we do eliminate a school day at the front end of the calendar year, then the last day will all bump one day. Yeah. Okay. That's right. I think that DOJ was advocating for the um, holidays to be named. Um, has there been any more discussion about that? I believe they advocated for them not to be named. Yeah, we resolved that at the last calendar iteration, and that's why we added the pieces around the recommendations from the agenda. The and the, so there has been no more yeah. discussion from them around no. that? Okay. I wonder if the week of January 20th should be orange and not purple? in March on the 6th and 14th are for K to 8? Yes. Is that, where's that written? <laughs> As the mom who took her son to the doctor in the morning, they said, it's a half day, you don't have to go. And oh. then found out, oh, it's on a half day at the high school. <laughs> like, oh. Actually, I didn't follow up on that. And I just wonder for, and I'm not, I'm not trying to crowd the calendar, I just maybe, and I probably missed uh, uh, communication, I'm sure. But I think for new high school parents, it can be a little confusing because you just see that yellow and you think, oh, it's a half day of conferences. Not, not connecting those dots as quickly as I should have that there are no conferences. You notice in the text it says pre K to 8. Where does it say that? That's what I'm missing. It oh, is it over right here? On the right hand column. Maybe we can bold that. Okay. It's right there. Yep. Maybe you can bold that because okay. I agree. Um, I think it's confusing to me every year. Because well, I look at the calendar, I say it's a half day, and then my high schoolers are like, what? It's not a half day. And I think I actually yeah. emailed Dr. But Blake you're right, it is there. I knew I was so. missing it somewhere. But may, yeah, maybe if we just hold it. Just ask the kids, they know. Well, mine didn't volunteer it. <laughs> That's not volunteering. I have lunch on the way. <laughs> um, <laughs> if you don't mind, uh, this is obviously, Amory is going to bring us a revised version that is, lar none of the revisions are substantive, but. Um, if you see anything that you think should be changed or edited over the next two weeks, please let me know. I can let Kirk and you let Emory get know, um, just so that she can add to whatever might be a little glitch, so that we can have a nice clean version to vote on in two weeks. Um, all right. So, seeing no more questions, thanks, Emory. Thank you. Run. <laughs> <laughs> So on to, maybe this is the main event, oh. uh, on to <laughs> the next item of new business. And um, we're going to be looking at the superintendent's presentation for his final evaluation. As he likes to say, uh, he is the lucky one who gets to have his evaluation done yes. in public. Yes. Um, so please note, guys, that he has this presentation that he is going to give to us. He also has the evaluation tool, that form, that is in the meeting materials, where he has kind of brought all the magic into one document. And so that is ultimately the document that you are going to use to write your individual evaluation that is to be submitted to Mike by 17th. May 17th. Okay, so there is definitely a quick turnaround with this. There always is. It is of necessity. Um, I want to say also quickly that if Stowe approves the regional agreement on Saturday, that the members who are currently on the school committee who are not serving next year will remain until the June organizational meeting and be a part of this evaluation process. Um, so that is that equates to Maureen and Brett new members who are coming onto the board will not um, be participating in this evaluation process. So with regard to the process, are there any questions before Kirk begins? 
quick question. Yes. yes. Can you just clarify? So I know it's due on the 17th, but you guys will send us the document that we need to make a copy of and fill out and get back to you by the 17th. You should, you should have a copy from our presentation from just, the last meeting. Just use that. I just okay. opened it up and made a copy. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, so it's in the meeting materials from the last meeting. Okay. Um, but we can definitely send you it again the hyper the link to the the template you make a copy of it and then it becomes yours um, whatever you create you can download it as PDF but it's probably better if you just reshare your copy with Mike as the chair of the personnel subcommittee he is going to be creating the composite evaluation which is then brought to the school committee on the 24th for discussion deliberation and ultimately a vote where we will kind of agree on what Kirk's ratings are. All right, so enough on process. Now let's get to the heart of the matter here. I'll turn it over to you, Kirk, and you can uh, tell us all that you've accomplished this year. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I appreciate that. Uh, I'll begin with my gratitude to this committee. As I gave my formative report, I went back and looked at the news and the feedback, uh, the notes I created from that evening and, and the feedback that you all provided me. And a special thanks to Mr. Haresh, as I've been harassing him for feedback throughout the process and he was the one that helped me finally get it. Abandon what you were doing, put it in this form and everyone will get it. <laughs> and so uh, once I picked up uh, on that, uh, we had some great success. So uh, in that way, the evidence presented to you in the report itself is quite extensive. This presentation won't be um, because I think you can go in and look at that evidence yourself and as we've been stating and pointing to in all of our schools committee agenda, uh, reports throughout the year, we've been pointing you to the very specific places where the activities that we've conducted in the school district this year point to areas of our strategic plan and our strategic work. Uh, so at the front of the presentation is a link to the full summary of evaluation report and these slides are simply just the headlines. So when we look at the uh, goals and objectives, uh, we have to think about this in terms of the professional practice goal and the student learning goal. Uh, and then the strategic objectives one, two, three, and four, these are the district improvement plan goals that are required by the Department of Education. So to get into these elements, professional practice goal uh, was an effort of working with my colleague, Ms. Stoika. We shared in the practice of this goal. Um, so as we look at this as the work of a team, and you're going to see all throughout this, as a superintendent, my work is everyone's work. And so it, yeah, I want you to just remember that, that we are a team. And, and certainly as the leader of the school system, um, you know, it is my responsibility to set the agenda and follow the agenda. And I believe it was Ms. Haresh, Haresh that said at the beginning of the year, this is an audacious plan. Let's see how we do. And I think you're going to find that we did pretty well. So. The first goal is around human resources and finding those high quality employees that we want to come work in Neshoba and serve long careers uh, to the students and the families here. So with that, uh, the big item, as we launch Unified Talent to create a database of applicants that will help us identify and target candidates for available positions. It interfaces directly with SchoolSpring so we can continue to utilize SchoolSpring to gather and point those candidates to our own database and as I reported before um, that allows us to then create that house of, of potential candidates when positions come up and actually proactively notify them rather than wait for them to find us. We've updated the job descriptions uh, to emphasize the diversity of our workforce. Uh, we put the core values of our strategic plan in those job descriptions. Oh, excuse me. Ah. Buttons. Um, we uh, expanded our search by uh, going on the roadshow. Ms. Stoika was very gracious in attending multiple um, 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 uh, job fairs this year with district administrators where people were then directed to come and submit their names into our database. Um, and we're working on some agreements with colleges uh, to get a pipeline of student teachers going, of which it, uh, Fitchburg State was recently uh, the university that, that we engaged with for that purpose. Um, we've introduced an implicit bias training to the Leadership Council and hiring committees to ensure uh, that we're fairly assessing the candidates in front of us 
the evidence that you'll see in the report is a four minute clip that's an introductory to what bias is when you look at things. Uh, so I encourage you to look at that. It's a, and you'll see a nice cameo of Ms. Stoika as, as you uh, examine that. We also launched Ardex, which helps us with our yearly mandated trainings. So as we look at those goals, it's not securing those um, folks, but it's also providing the required trainings to ensure that they understand the roles and responsibilities of their positions and what they're obligated to do. In our student learning goal, uh, this was focused on curriculum. And all throughout the year, we've been coming back to this committee with curriculum, curriculum, and curriculum. I want to commend Ms. Friend, um, Assistant Superintendent Friend, and her team for the deep work that they did this year within the curriculum. So all of the 6 through 12 curriculum has now been cataloged and organized. It doesn't mean it's all been rewritten and updated, I want to remind the committee. Um, as Ms. Friend presented in, on the curriculum, uh, various segments, uh, departments will be put into one, two, three, four, five year step of that curriculum renewal cycle and even notify the committee tonight that um, uh, remind you at least that science is on the docket for a year run of that analysis next year. Uh, but really kind of gone beyond in this goal with the implementation of Bridges of math Mathematics in the elementary arena and the reach of our related arts into the elementary arena as well. So we were able to get some high quality curriculum work done um, outside the bandwidth of 6 to 12 that we set our goal out for at the beginning of the year. So those are the two goals we identified specifically for me to be thinking about in terms of professional practice and student learning. Let's take a look at our strategic objectives. So you can see in the margin, I identified this as district improvement goal number one because, and frankly, I should have put three there because on your form, these are goals three through six. So forgive my error. Uh, but it is strategic objective number one that is um, uh, connections and communications. So we're working hard on communications. Um, and I know that uh, uh, in going through this work, even today, I thought about, boy, there are some elements of communications that um, I did not even highlight in this document that need to be highlighted with the onboarding of our communication strategist, uh, Bridget Hannigan, uh, to the school system was a big step in communications. So I'm going to ask the committee to consider that. I'm going to add that into the notes of my evaluation after this meeting because that's a dynamic uh, document. Uh, her participation with our communication <coughs> subcommittee, um, specifically Ms. Cohen, uh, both on the building project but other district information has been invaluable to us. Uh, so we've been very happy to have that. Uh, but we've been focusing on the strategic initiatives one, two, and three within that domain, and the evidence is spread throughout, uh, of which the, the one that is most obvious to our community is the common. Uh, we have received, you'll see the, the sc uh, screenshot in there, uh, we're averaging over 5,000 hits a week on the common, uh, which is great feedback to tell us people are reading our information and clicking on it to check it out. So we're very happy about it. To give it a sense, we have uh, 3,100 students, just over 2,000 families, and we're getting over 5,000 looks. So that tells us people are looking at it and they're going back and looking at it again. So that's great news and is telling us that our communications are reaching our community. Uh, strategic plan objective two, uh, learning, teaching, and leading. You can see the real focus there that we put uh, is expressed in the professional practice goals. So you'll see a lot of redundancy in the evidence of the professional practice goal and also within the strategic plan because both the professional practice goal and the student learning goal are embedded within the strategic plan but was an area where I had uh, some focus as well. So uh, these are the initiatives uh, that have been addressed and reported back to you at school committee meetings all throughout the year. Um, of which, uh, again, the curriculum work is the highlight of uh, objective two. Culture and belonging. Um, we are hard at work at uh, getting our equity audit launched and on the way, and I know we'll be coming to the school committee about that here, uh, I think in our next meeting, uh, Mr. Most Mulcan, likely the one after, but. Uh, most likely the one after. Um, as, as we have gone through the process, our team has evaluated, we'll be ready to report back on that in a recommended vendor uh, based upon the evaluative process of how that, that looks. Um, and so we'll be coming back and giving the committee that information as we move forward. That's not a, uh, um, an action item for the committee, but we'll bring it back as information. Um, 
So we're looking at how we're uh, integrating our social learning, learning practices, which I'll highlight was Dr. Epstein coming and working with our faculty and staff this year on calm, compassionate teaching. Um, and that growing of the show identity. Uh, we kicked off the year with all of our principals presenting their school improvement plans together. And the biggest impact we're gonna have on creating a K-12, pre-K-12 in the by identity is through the leadership. And if we all as a leadership team view ourselves through that lens, it's going to translate in the work through our schools. Finally, in Objective 4, Human Resources facility, Facilities and Finance, some of the distributed leadership uh, plans that we're moving forward with uh, was quite a bit of discussion in front of this committee this year. So we talked about learning uh, coaches, both math and literacy coaches, director of innovation and digital learning positions, as well as how we are looking at optimizing our, our administrative staffing. We had a reduction in administration, but we were able to put the deans into the budget to balance out the student life aspects. So I think that really highlights domain four as we're taking action steps forward on building that distributive leadership uh, strategy so that we can conduct the business of the district in a responsible way. And I spoke to already the recruiting and hiring efforts that uh, Ms. Stoika and I partnered on together. So the second part of the evaluation that you'll be looking at, so section one is around the goals. The second part is the professional standards. So the, uh, there's four uh, professional standards, instructional leadership, management and operations, family and community engagement, and professional culture. And so we identified what are gonna be the key focus elements this year. So in working with the evaluation and supervision subcommittee, we looked at these goals as the focus, and that's what's outlined in the document that uh, uh, Mr. Harris was able to provide to the committee. Uh, we have curriculum and assessment in standard one, uh, environment, human resources management and development in standard two, family and community engagement in standard three, and in professional culture, communications and shared vision. You'll notice we talked about having six goals, but communication, uh, lays over both of those areas, which is why we included communication in both of those. And I thought it was particularly important that we put shared vision into the focus goals as well, because we cannot do this work alone. A superintendent cannot run a school system by himself. It's impossible. Uh, you have to have many people doing great work as we have uh, in our school system here. So with that, I'm actually gonna come out of this and go into the document itself for the benefit of the committee. that's large enough. So the way the document is, is laid out um, is there's a brief part in the beginning that introduces you to the structure of the document that outlines what I just showed you in the presentation. And then we get directly into the professional practice goal. The goal is written into the description and under superintendent comments and analysis, you'll see the detail of all the elements that I spoke to, the link to unified talent. So in the links, some of the things like, I can't publicly put access of unified talent into the document. So it's a link back to unified talent so you can see what it does for us. Um, uh, you'll see the, the job descriptions to see where that was cited, our efforts at the job fairs, and our ed. So the links follow along in each one of those steps around the goals. So again, in the curriculum work here, you're going to see uh, these particular links. You're going the the um, um, as we get into here in the supports and the TNL presentation that was provided to you this year. The curriculum review process packet also is, is an important piece. Um, and the organizing of district curriculum inventory. So there's lots of elements in there within the curriculum that you can look at that work. Here's what I will say. And this is, this is what is so tricky when we're talking about a goal. And are we in progress? Have we met the progress? Have we exceeded the goal, right? Um, curriculum work is never done. You're per perpetually meeting it. But the question is, did we meet the standards of excellence that we expect of ourselves in examining the work that we could do around the curriculum in one year's time? And what I'm gonna suggest to this committee is that uh, through the hard work of our educators provided by the leadership of Assistant Superintendent Friend at my direction, 
and my review as we work on this process throughout the year is going to show that they did outstanding work and we have really set the table to do some deep curriculum work by department on a year-over-year -year basis that is now baked into the school system in a way where we can grow. Uh, continuing on uh, through the goals, I won't go through all these structures, but you're going to see it's a robust, robust data set that gets into all the detail. Some of the things don't have links because they're not things that necessarily uh, project to, to specifically. So I have, unfortunately, like even this evening, Dear Jay is, is, I think, meeting this evening. So I have been able to get to a handful of Dear Jay meetings this year. Um, I think two appearances of Budget and Warrant Subcommittee. Um, and then I've been appearing at the Council on Aging of all three of our towns, our Rotary Clubs. Um, we added the meetings to all of our select boards this year to present the board briefs. Um, of which I would encourage you to look at uh, the last board brief we presented to the town of Stowe because it really outlined uh, uh, the reimbursement process uh, that the MSBA goes through in terms of de determining their effective rate of reimbursement. It just goes to show those are the efforts and communication that are made around what we need to, to do there. Uh, moving into teaching, learning, and leading, I think I've spoken to that. You'll see uh, while in the goal, it's around um, curriculum, you're going to see there's a lot more work within teaching, learning, and leading that needs to be referenced in terms of the uh, specific goals that are identified. Uh, the strategic plan uh, around culture and belonging, the direct evidence links there, and then of course human resources, facilities, and finance. And the last section is around the performance standards. It's sorted somewhat differently. It's sorted in this way where you are able to read the definitions of the levels of performance and over to the right hand column cited evidence is where you see the links of the work that we did relative to that standard that has been brought forward to this committee this year. So you'll see that for each one of the goals how it's laid out and uh, was able to sort of color code them in a way so you can stay in one goal in one place at a time to give you easy access. Uh, these are the tips that Mr. Her Mr. Haresh provides me for easy, uh, for easy reading and, and reference. Um, and so with that, Madam Chair, um, I'll turn it back to you for any questions or comments regarding the evidence and process. <clears throat> I hope uh, the community doesn't mind if I start by saying Bravo. <laughs> uh, you are a wonder to us all, truly. Um, certainly there are always places to improve and we're always looking for continuous improvement as educators. Um, but you set a very high standard for yourself. Um, we appreciate that and our kids benefit from it. So. I appreciate that, thank you. Um, now that said, uh, this is after all an evaluation. So we do need to bring forth things that um, that we wonder or anything that you have questions on and statements we'd like to start amy i do have hopefully a simple question um you mentioned the i'm gonna botch the title but you were creating a position for the director of innovation and digital, digital learning yeah um forgive me if i missed it but what is the status of that has that been has that person been identified, or is that so, created already? Or? I'm, so yes, that was all a part of the budget. Uh, two of our three towns have passed the budget, so we have moved forward with interviews okay. regarding those positions now. So like, we're now in the throes of the hiring season. Uh, I will tell you for that position, um, we're gonna be very thorough, and we're gonna have high standards for uh, the position. I would rather we hold it and wait for the right person to come along and support than to just take the candidate that that applies and is in the field. So we are looking at that. We have been talking to candidates. We're going to continue to talk to candidates. So um, a hire is not ready to be announced as, as we're continuing that search, but that has been posted on our brand new uh, employee system um, and, and we've been talking to candidates. Thank you. 
Yeah, um, I've been, like I said, I've been really impressed with all the work around the budget and like the transparency, the communication, and that's been fantastic. Um, and excited to see that. I guess my questions are about the curriculum. Um, so I was looking at the curriculum maps and I noticed that they're, they don't seem to be consistent. Like the grade seven one is very well mapped out. Um, the science, I mean, it's got assessments. I, I looked at that and I had a very good feel for what those kids are doing. But the other documents um, aren't like that. And I guess my concern is with, I love that it's backward design and we're thinking, you know, we're thinking about what's our end goal here. And so I'm wondering where those assessments are in the other ones, like, and it's not fleshed out like it is in that one. So is that going to be, are they all going to be consistent with the grade seven science and flesh out like what that, because I guess I'm concerned about assessment. I really want to see what kind of assessments are being done and um, across all disciplines. And I, I hope that the other disciplines are going to look that way, where I get a really good feel for what kids are doing and how they're being assessed. So Ms. Vessels, I'm going to take you back to what the goal was at the beginning of the year. We need to corral the curriculum. What you're seeing, you know, how the goal was written was to corral the curriculum and bring it all together in those places. The impact of doing that is it reveals those things. So what we have to do now is apply the curriculum review cycle to that because I'm exactly where you sit on that. We teach what we assess. So when we look at, at teaching and learning in our school systems, looking at those assessments, so you better bet when we get into those deep curriculum review cycles, that is where the beginning point is. And so that's where those things are going to be growing and how our directors and both assistant superintendent are going to be interacting with our teachers. So this is going to be a multi-year process to get to these places and get to those points. So um, I wish we had a, an army of people to do all departments at all times, uh, but we simply don't. So we're, we're going to have to prioritize. We're prioritizing <coughs> science as an area that we're looking into immediately next year. I would actually um, echo what Amy had to say, and I know that I always beat this curriculum drum. Um, and you know, curriculum is an umbrella term for curriculum, instruction, and assessment. And I think that, um, and again, we are high school teachers, and so that is where our uh, expertise lies. And we also have children at the high school. And so we see this from multiple viewpoints, obviously. Um, assessment is, the authenticity of assessment needs work. Um, I know that there is a heavy emphasis on college board examination style assessments that are heavy with multiple choice, and it is more than weekly. Um, this is not what kids need to be proficient at, taking multiple choice tests. And so, Whereas I recognize, and I think everybody recognizes, the incredible progress you have truly, truly made. Um, and that is what the goal was, was to make progress. And I really applaud you, and I appreciate it, and I'm grateful. I would like to just put on the table that this is the beginning. You probably know that too. We have got a long way to go still until our kids start to feel <coughs> the the impact of the curriculum review cycle. So for, for my children, they will be long into college before they experience any of the good, amazing work that is being done at this level and as it gets down into the work of our educators who are talented individuals and more than capable of authenticity. And, and it happens all the time, but I think that what um, Amy is saying, and I have to agree, is that consistency is key. And what I know is that teachers oftentimes exist in their silo where they believe what they are doing is the right thing in their silo, but what ends up happening is that the children get up from my silo and they go to the next silo. And so it is the experience of kids that needs to be front and center of how we plan. And if they are being taught X in this silo and Y in this silo, it's incredibly disorienting for kids. And so as, as you go forward, um, and as you continue to set goals in the future, I know that this will be front and center. Mm -hmm. I know that this is something that you have an amazing team working on, people who have been in this room with us, and I'm so grateful. I want to keep laser focused on this. 
because it is, it's just not there yet with the consistency piece and it's not hitting the ground level. And I really do want to make sure that I, I see tons of work being done consistently at the elementary school and starting to move up into the middle school and I know that it's happening at the high school. I just need to see that impact kids so that they can have a rich and authentic experience across all the silos. So you're making me think of two things and, and one is we repeat these goals. Um, when you have a system where you have a goal and then you check and you move on, it just gets lost. So you're going to see that. The second thing you're making me think of, um, as you talked about that, is, is, a, is a Chinese proverb of they're, they're the two best times to plant and enjoy a tree are 30 years ago <laughs> and today. And it's a piece of wisdom that basically says we can't be focused on 30 years ago, but we can focus on today for what is going to be there in the future. And that's the approach we've taken, is we're focused on the here and now and, and couldn't agree more that, that we want to have that. I guess I had one other question. Um, in the part of this, looking at the changes in the review, um, are you going to ask kids to be part of that assessment process of what's happening with the curriculum? Are you going to get their feedback about assessments and what's happening in the classroom? Yeah, I think that work's already done this year. It has happened this year in terms of um, Ms. Friend's interviews with students in her uh, entry plan work. Yes, we will continue with that. Uh, any other different questions, similar questions, anything else you're wondering? Mike. This is more of a comment to the committee. Um, I, I know that when I looked at the document, the uh, the document with all the with all the goals in the in the, uh, in the data, it was 22 pages long. Uh, hopefully, it feels more uh, sorry. It hopefully, feels less exhausting and more exhaustive, um, because really, what this is is a is a way to demonstrate all of this progress made towards goals, and it's up to you to decide to what extent that progress has been made. So clearly, a tremendous amount of work and energy has gone into the self evaluation, um, and I would just. Um, respect, respectfully suggest that we try to um, confer a, a commensurate amount of energy into the evaluation. Um, it, it, I've gone through a few of these and it does take a while. In fact, I've already chipped away at some of them and we only have a one week turnaround from today. Um, so um, I would just suggest that if you're going to really dig deep into the evaluation, start sooner rather than later. Um, and also, um, keep in mind that there's, with the training that we did, this is a five-step cycle and the evaluate. The self-evaluation sort of represents the end, but also the beginning. And the next step is to establish the goals for next year. And so this would be an opportunity to sort of formulate some thoughts on um, what are some areas that the superintendent could um, consider next year as well. So part of providing that, feed that feedback is going to feed into that next step of the of the cycle. So keep that in mind as well. Thanks, Mike. Any other comments or questions? Uh, so maybe I will wrap by saying bravo. Thank you. Uh, uh, we said at the beginning we will likely be saying it uh, for a while. You take an enormous amount on, and you do it with what seems to be very little effort, although I know <laughs> that you are uh, working pretty darn hard, Kirk. So uh, we are super appreciative of not only your hard work, but also the work of your team. You have a fantastic army of, a small little tiny army of people doing great work for kids in this district. And that then pushes out to all of our amazing educators who uh, are so gifted and so capable that um, you know it's what keeps the show great. So we do appreciate you know despite what I said a minute ago. Um, please know that I appreciate everything that you're doing. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I'm humbled by your comments, and I just I I, I must reiterate um, while things aren't easy, it the only reason why it may 
look that we can handle things with ease is because the amazing people doing the work, um, they're the linchpin. And as we get together, I think that's the element of a shared vision. So as we look at those things and you look at that, that piece of shared vision in the evaluation document, it's reflected in, in the hard work of all the people, the people that are in this room, but the vast majority of people that aren't in this room that have gone down deep, that have participated in the, in the working sessions, um, in all the, the all the things that we've been able to do that, that have their stamp on that. So I appreciate that, and I'll accept that compliment with graciousness, uh, with acknowledgement that it's, it's a whole group of people. I'd just add that I think the lack of questioning reflects the amount of work that's gone into the self-evaluation report because it's presented in a way that um, makes sense and will make it easy f easier for us to do our individual assessments. So bravo on that as well. Um, so to our personnel subcommittee chair, I just wanted to perhaps remind the committee that when we come back together on the 24th, Mike is actually going to bring forward the composite evaluation, which is going to be a combination of all 11 um, individual evaluations. So the uh, Massachusetts, Mass General Law or like regulation requires that we kind of come to agreement on how Mike should compile the individual evaluations. So um, I open the floor to anyone who wants to weigh in on that and how you want Mike to proceed once he has all 11 in his hands. I mean, if, if there, so for example, if one evalu evaluation comes through and it's a complete outlier, um, how should Mike handle that? I don't imagine that that will happen, but if it does happen, or maybe there's just one piece that is completely outside um, the average score, et cetera. Um, I, I think that my um, opinion on that would be to present whatever, if there is an outlier, that's all that needs to be said, is that the majority of opinions represented are represented, however, there was one dissenting opinion or something like that, just so it's captured within the uh, summative evaluation. I think that's the fairest way to do it because otherwise that piece is lost. If Mike um, doesn't include that in his summative evaluation, that, that's my feeling. I, I don't and know so in the narrative, that. he could allude to that yet explain why the rating was not necessarily affected by that outlier. That would be my preference. And the, the other thing that I was going to um, mention, I wonder if there's a way to, I'm not sure that the form allows for this, but is there a way to say that, you know, we have an 11 member committee, this summative um, evaluation represents feedback from 11 members or <coughs> however many members, just so that there is some way to capture how representative it is? Yeah. Um, Any other comments on process? But ultimately, we will be able to make a judgment on whether we agree with Mike's presentation of, by, by taking a vote. If we feel that he hasn't captured our own opinion of a rating, then we can, we're gonna have a discussion about it. We are. right? And we could, if so. we disagree on the rating or if we want to change the rating that Mike has concluded is appropriate, we could amend the document in real time. Right. There are some committees that write the evaluation in the public meeting. Uh, right. So there, there are a handful of ways that you can do this. The way that we do it is the way that we've described. It is, I think, the most effective and efficient. Um, so we, we task somebody who's deeply invested and involved in this process, and then we vote. Um. No, I feel like I should be renting a, a hotel room for 48 hours and <laughs> digging in this stuff. Um, 
<laughs> I will say that the more work we do, the easier it will be for Mike. Mm -hmm. um, so, like he said, please put some time and energy into this. Get it to him on time uh, without delay, or even early, if you're able. Yeah, and we want, we want the composite, obviously, to be representative, right? So if you feel a certain way, um, and for whatever reason, either don't get to it on time or, or don't get, feel like you can't do it, unfortunately, that means that your perspective is not going to be included in the composite. And that's not uh, a bias. That's just uh, someone who's developing the composite can only develop it from the, the evaluations that have been submitted. So this is where your voice can be heard. So I would recommend expressing, expressing that voice. Awesome. And thanks to you, Mike. I haven't done anything yet. For doing the work eventually. <laughs> uh, all right, everybody. So again, thank you, Kirk. Uh, onward and upward. So now we'll go to unfinished business. We'll look at the physician's contract. And I think I'm ready for a motion on that. <clears throat> I will move to authorize the superintendent to sign the 2023-2024 school year physician's contract between the district and Dr. Russell Coleman. Dr. Coleman will receive a $5,000 stipend under the terms of the contract. Second. Second. Thanks, Sharon. Any discussion? Yeah, I have a question. <clears throat> so this document, this is a document that <clears throat> that the district prepares, and I assume is then presented to the physician for his signature without any sort of negotiation in regards to its terms. Is that how, is that how we've done it? Uh, yes, it, is the, it is the contract that has been historically used, and um, last year uh, this committee approved an increase from the previous level of, I believe it was a $2,000 consultant fee to a $5,000 well, I, I have I have no, take no exception with the uh, remuneration attended to this contract. The only thing that just jumped out at me was that looking at um, section six, it says that the school physician may represent the schools on health issues in the media as appropriate and provide general consultation to the school districts on matters relating to the health of the student's population. Okay, so looking at the first sentence, the school physician may represent the schools on health issues in the media. From my perspective, and I'll leave it to the superintendent, I would feel more comfortable if that said that subject to the approval of the superintendent, the school physician may represent the school on health issues. Because what it's written now, he, he or she may go out and he's contractually entitled to go out and espouse his opinion uh, on whatever health issue may be affecting the school. Generally, it would. I, I'm just throwing that out as a possible amendment to the agreement that we would want that to be subject to your approval, Superintendent Downing. So. I, I think it's a fabulous recommendation. All right, so then I will, in that regard, so the superintendent's <laughs> assessment of my recommendation, I would move to amend the motion to include language that Section 6 have uh, that, that the school physician, school physician may represent the schools on health issues subject to the approval of the superintendent director. And I'll second that amendment, or Senator, that motion. So about the first motion that was on the board. Um, Sharon, Sharon seconded second, yeah. Now we have an amendment to the motion that we need to vote first before we can move back to the original motion. I have, dis and I have discussion um, on the amendment. Do we need to get the physician's approval before we vote the contract? No. Okay, got it. Any other discussion on the amendment? Okay. All those in favor of amending it to include that additional language? Raise your hand. Great. So the amendment, <clears throat> the motion, the original motion is now amended. Any further discussion on the contract? Excellent. All those in favor of this district's physician's contract? Raise your hand. Okay. Excellent. So that's good. I always do. Appreciate Attorney Gleason's recommendations. On <laughs> <laughs> he speaks he's to got that, He's got that eagle on it. Serves us so well. No, that's a good. It was a very very good amendment. Thanks, Joe. Thank you. Um, so now we can move on to. Um, now we can move on to the food services rates, and I'm I'm looking for another motion. Okay, I will move to approve the school lunch rate of $3.70 for fiscal year 24. I'll second that. 
Any discussion on the rate? Yes, what? I kind of brought this up last time, and you know, it's it's tangential to the rate itself, except insofar as you know. Again, the quality. I don't know if anyone. I want to know if anyone on the staff has tried the meals in recent history. We eat them all the time. Yeah. You eat the cafeteria food. So it's, it's a good quality. You're happy with it. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think there's room for improvement with food, and, and we, we, we've had discussions about that, and so that is an area we're looking at, yes. Uh, I will say, too, that um, this these rates is really about, all of these rates is really about the extra lunch, because original lunch is free. The, yeah. the rate is directed. Please speak. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for the recognition. Uh, so the rate is directly tied to the reimbursement. In that, if our rate does not, or is not at the same level of the reimbursement rate, we can't have it that way. Because if our rate was, I'm gonna use general terms, if our rate was $3.20, and, and and the reimbursement was 350 we would therefore be making revenue, not reimbursement. So our rate needs to be at or below, or excuse me, at or above the reimbursement rate. So we aren't um, generating revenue out of the reimbursement, if that makes sense. Yeah. And this, um, just as a tangent here, free lunch is something that the state funded this year. The federal government did not, and that it is potentially on the table uh, rather, it will be taken off the table in the next fiscal year. I would just say that um, I received and we all received, I think everybody received an email from high school students looking to advocate for continuing the free lunch program. Um, they were pretty adamant about it. And so I, you know, I opened a conversation with them to say that this is not necessarily something that we have control over, that they need to go kind of above our heads as it is. Um, but I just wanted to put that on the table. If there are students in the high school right now that appreciate the free lunch, they think it should remain, um, and getting this reimbursement plan in line is really important for kids. Okay. Any other um, debate, discussion? All right, all those in favor of the uh, rate change? Great. All right, again, that's thanks everyone. Um, so if you don't mind, uh, and without objection, I would like to take the subcommittee goals check-in I'm going to tuck that into the subcommittee reports. So as we go through the subcommittee reports, we can um, not only report out, but also give a quick um, update on the goals. But before I do that, I want to insert, hopefully without objection, one small item into, um, <coughs> it was supposed to go into the superintendent's report, but uh, it's fallen down here. Kirk, I want to give you the floor Thank because you. you have a quick recognition to complete. Ma Madam Chair, I think your kind words made me blush and it got me you know, off my mark in terms of how I wanted to wrap up. <laughs> <laughs> so for good reason. I just wanted to take this moment to acknowledge um, my colleagues, uh, Assistant Superintendent Fenn, Finance and Operations Director Ross Mulcairn. They gave their entry plans recently and we did that um, via Zoom. They did an outstanding job and I think their deep look at our school system is going to benefit us as we continue that work over year over year. So, um, behalf of myself and our school committee, we got you a token of, of appreciation. <laughs> please, please open them. Thanks, everyone. The day of gift giving. Love it. Christmas in May or August or May? <laughs> <laughs> it's a race. <laughs> If they can get your kids the same gifts, and then...
on the agenda here. We're, we are cruising in for an early end. Don't Woo! jinx it. Do that. Don't jinx it. Okay, sorry. Don't sorry. Worry. Just say it just, loud. Why did you put that out there? Why did you put that out there? Mike said earlier, he's like, is my share out too long? <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> yeah, for your enthusiasm, it's fine. Okay, good. Um, so I actually wonder if I can have, if I can drive a leader. How do you feel about that? Cool. Uh, so what I have here is the full committee goals kind of reflection that as you guys share out, I'm going to type in. Magic. Okay. Um, so we have this part that includes all of the information that we uh, built at the beginning of the year at our August workshop. And so perhaps you guys can do just your regular subcommittee report and then transition to kind of a goal reflection, how we did, what's the result as we round the corner toward the end of the school year. I will jot all of that down. It will then help to inform our next round of goal setting. Um, and as you guys can see at the very bottom here, there is a survey for you. It's basically a school committee exit survey that again, the results of this will be can be used at the August workshop to kind of help us set our goals for the next go around. It also asks you to give um, your leadership team a little bit of uh, feedback on you know, how the year has gone and, and any recommendations that you have for the future. Okay, so going back up here, uh, let's talk first with budget and warrant. So a little update and then. Goals. All right. Well, our update is that we have not yet met since our last report out, but um, uh, we plan on meeting on Monday, the 15th, where we'll get our operations report from April. Is that right? Um, since our last meeting, we did issue a request for volunteers for the OMAC, and we've since gotten um, three responses from our residents. Um, all of which happen to be from Bolton, which I'm quite proud of. <laughs> um, and so we will, in our next meeting, we're going to be discussing how we're going to um, uh, proceed with membership and approval of membership once that comes into focus. Uh, with regards to our goals, uh, as chair of the subcommittee, I will report on um, our what I feel is our progress towards our goals, but other members... Uh, that being Scott. <laughs> um, if you want to add something or uh, provide um, some color to it, by all means, go ahead and do so. Um, uh, I, I'm not going to repeat what our, our action steps are for our goal, but the goal in general is to make sure... Um, uh, oh wait, can we, can we scroll down to... Oh, I'm so sorry. Yeah, that's all right. I'm so sorry. There we go, yeah. Our stated goal um, is the, the Re Michelle Regional School Committee will increase accessibility to and visibility of the development of the FY24 district budget. Um, for my lens, it feels like we've made a lot of progress. Um, we, have, we started off by publicly utilizing and following the budget timeline issued by um, Finance and Operations Manager um, Ross Mulcairin uh, from the fall, and we stayed true to that. Yeah. I'm sorry? I, sh I thought you were typing, but I didn't see it on the screen, but now I do. Oh, okay. Um, we uh, have brought greater levels of transparency to the budget building process by um, extending more of our work with the towns and explicitly sharing out um, what our efficiencies have been for the FY24 budget. Um, particularly during the budget se season, we worked to issue invitations to our monthly meetings to members from all three towns, including FinCon reps, <laughs> town administrators, and select board members, as well as residents that have expressed interest in particular agenda items. Um, so we brought sort of uh, other members of uh, the towns into our sphere. Um, recently we've developed and recommended a streamlined protocol for reviewing the signing off of bi-weekly warrants. Um, we've worked with the town FinComs and advisory committees to build uh, trust, viability, and sustainability to the budget process. Uh, throughout the budget season, uh, beginning in the fall. Uh, we 
provided actionable, actionable feedback to the district on how to improve monthly operations reports, budget updates, and our um, newly formatted and parenthetically fantastic budget book. Um, let's see, we've got two more, just bear with me. Sorry, three more. Uh, we've held meetings dedicated to um, disseminating the understanding of the district's OPED liability, which feeds into our budget process. And with the help of Mr. Mulcairn, we've contextualized that liability as compared to other regionalized districts. And of course, we've developed and recommended the OMAC. Um, so I hope that wasn't too much, but it feels like we've made pretty significant progress towards our goals. Scott, do you have anything you want to add? No, I think you covered it. Thank okay. you. So that was budget and warrant, and I wonder if there are any questions, any thoughts? All right. You guys have done a whole lot. We really appreciate the leadership on that mic. It's been a really, really effective year for budget and warrant with the help of Ross and Kirk and others from the town leadership all the way up and down. So a uh, lot to be proud of there. I want to extend a, a special thanks to, to Ross for uh, integrating himself so completely into that whole process and really being great about accepting feedback and then working that feedback into mm -hmm. um, a new vision of how the budget process exists in the district. So thank you. Thank you. All right, everybody. So next up is communication. So um, communication met last week just to... Um, kind of go th through the goals and um, create a, um, you know, what we're going to report on tonight. Um, communication continues to work with policy on the revisions of the school committee manual and that meeting is going to take place on Thursday, right? Tomorrow. Um, so for our goals for this year, I think we refined our, our goals a little bit from what is put on there. Um, we are, Our first goal was a rep uh, creating a newsletter um, for school committee information to be um, distributed with the communities and um, through conversations with CARC it was decided that our, a more effective way to share school committee information and updates was through his weekly newsletter. Um, that's been in place for several months now and it's worked really well. Um, so that feels like um, a good accomplishment in terms of getting information about the school committee, um, what the school committee is working on to our communities. Um, our second piece of that goal was to create a survey on the effectiveness of, of that newsletter, which became really not applicable because we didn't create a standalone newsletter. I think it's been far more effective having it go through weekly uh, communication from the superintendent's office. Um, and then our final goals were around creating a database of resource documents um, that has a, proved to be a little bit more elusive in um, coming together. However, I think that um, through the process of working on the manual, we really laid the groundwork for that to um, really come together quite quickly, hopefully. Um, not before the end of this year, but hopefully um, in the next year. Um, we switched gears in January to work on updating the school committee manual and realized that this is a really good way to um, create that, com that uh, collection of documents um, and a great way to warehouse some of those documents for school committee members. Um, so a link to those documents will be in the school committee manual which will serve as a resource um, for members. Um, and then there's additional piece of that which is creating an outward facing, putting that information in an outward facing form so that community members can access that as well. Um, the digging through the school committee manual is not an effective way to share that information. There will be, I think, two different ways of presenting the same information. So one way of that database will be through the school committee manual and the second way will be in another format that is accessible to the community. Um, that piece has not been developed yet. Thanks, 
Thanks, Sharon. I think that that's going to actually be a really effective tool. Um, it's a work in progress. Any questions, comments? Do you have anything to add to that? I mean, I think I would say one thing that, like, we have gotten emails this year from community members looking for things, right, for minutes. And so I think that idea of some place where we kind of house things that are that many people want to see, we have to deal with that. Yeah. And I remember hearing Ross in his entry plan talk about wanting to create some kind of a warehouse for things that are related to your department. Um, there are more, there's, you know, that's not the only, but that warehouse could be what we link to. And so making sure that we're not doubling the effort mm -hmm. is important. So working in collaboration with Kirk on how we can best communicate school committee things to the public. The major reason why we're sh shifting to AptoG for our platform. Right. And when does and that, that go live? July. Exciting. So, you know, that they'll walk the current website over to the new website, and then we got just because when contracts start and end, so then they'll, they'll put it in the templates and formats, and then we'll go and start building this. It's good summer work. Okay, great. All right. Uh, next. Do you want to just come back to me at the end? You well, yeah. Not. No, that's not. I just know you're, you're doing the subcommittees and the goals and what have you. Mine's not going to be as. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so let's jump, let's leapfrog over the building committee and um, go over to personnel. Okay. Um, well, um, we did provide an update on our progress at the, the uh, formative stage of the goals. But um, as a summative check in, the, 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 the subcommittee did work with the superintendent back in September to help establish the district goals for the current academic year um, through the strategic plan as a basis for um, that goal setting. Um, we did make recommendations for approving the superintendent goals um, to the broader subcommittee, uh, and the superintendent obviously has um, completed his own self-evaluation on those goals. Um, we, as a committee, uh, developed and uh, issued formative and summative uh, evaluation trainings to the school committee to help bring clarity to the process. Um, uh, we also worked to bring a level of clarity to the evaluation rubric and provide, uh, and also to provide feedback directly to the superintendent regarding his own self-assessment in order to bring greater accessibility to the document. And um, one of the components of our goals was to bring uh, a full participation to the summit of evaluation. So we won't really know about that full participation until the evaluation process um, our part of it is completed by the 17th. So hopefully um, we'll get full participation. Awesome. Thank you. Do you have anything to add, by all means? No. And if uh, anybody else, you know, this can be something that we, this is part of the feedback loop is that if you guys felt like this was not effective, if the evaluation process could be improved in some way, shape, or form, when you go to do that exit survey, put that there. So that in August when we meet, the person whoever's on personnel subcommittee will have kind of their marching orders for the next go around. Mm -hmm. Although I imagine it's gonna be perfect. <laughs> <laughs> no. no. All right. So let us I'm actually gonna go I'm gonna go up to policy and ask policy to share out next. Policy uh, does not have a new report, but we are meeting tomorrow with communication to kind of um, fine tune what we have done on school committee manual um, so far since January. Uh, and in terms of the goal for policy, our goal was to really um, continue to review and revise policies to make sure they're up to date in terms of mass general law and uh, DASI standards, and then also to have the lens of um, diversity, equity, and inclusion when we are reviewing policies. Um, we certainly did that when policies came our way. We did sort of shift to the school committee manual um, mid-year and um, have definitely done the same. We made sure to have that discussion and keep that on the radar as we went through the manual. 
which is not done and will not be done fully this year. It is new work. Did you interface with Dear J at all? Wasn't there some interaction there? Not this year. Last year we did. Their interface has been more through communication this year. Okay. We did not have um, our interface with Dear J this year was going to be if we had questions come up through policies, but we did not have specific questions this year. Okay. Thanks, policy. Appreciate it. Uh, the last piece here. Um, I'm actually going to turn this to Mike to start, and then Mike, you can throw it to either Sharon or Karen. Um, personnel is part of personnel's charge is the school committee manual, and as personnel met and we discussed it, we felt like this might actually be better to move the school committee manual to communication and make that their primary charge to help them have purpose that is within our purview. Um, and so we did start to transition that because they accepted the challenge, but Mike, anything that you wanted to add on that? Well, I think, um, and I haven't had a chance to meet um, with communication or policy about this, and I'm extending a public okay. apology. No, I, <laughs> I saw your email and I, I bowed my head in shame. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, we did realize that a lot of the changes that we were going to recommend would um, be directly tied back to um, um, the, the, the state statute. Um, so that's where we're going to be going with this. Um, and it, 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 I think it appears on the surface as maybe a shirking of responsibilities. <laughs> it is not a shirking of responsibilities, but it felt like we were drilling a little bit too deeply <laughs> nice, with thanks, regards to the Shoba, um, and that we wanted to direct everyone back to um, a more established statute. Um, but you guys can fill in the details as well. Yeah, I'm sharing a, a chime in, but um, yeah, I mean, I, I, it feels like as we've kind of gotten deeper into it, that it actually is sort of everybody's charge a little bit, because there are pieces that uh, you know, policy looks at and says, you know what, I don't feel comfortable reviewing these descriptions and making adjustments, so I'm going to ask Mike what he thinks, that, you know, or, or communication. So I think it is, um, it's going to keep evolving. It has been a little bit challenging. Um, I mean, everybody's been great and everybody has, has taken on different pieces, um, but there's more to do. So um, I think it's going to kind of be an ongoing piece. So when it is fully done, it will be sometime next year before it's fully done. I would put on the table that um, as the person who has done a bunch of school committee orientations, that I view the manual as something that could be used as the orientation guide. Mm -hmm. And if we, right, so like I feel like the manual has always been kind of nebulous as to is this thing's purpose because if you look at the current manual it's odd um, I'm not completely sure it is du it's like it duplicates and there yeah it, it's pretty lengthy yeah too. it is you know <laughs> the stuff that you find in there and you might find little. other important stuff that's not in there so it's always been a little questionable to me so I think that as we move forward I think that we all need to make sure that we understand what is the purpose of the manual why does it exist I would posit that its purpose should be for orientation um, and then it can be also a reference for school committee members on the fly, but also community members to understand what, what we, we do. do. Yeah. Um, so again, this is something that, and again, I, I, I think that because the communication subcommittee is at this point in time either needing to kind of come off the list or needs a job to do, some, and because this is something that's important and we need to put somebody in charge of it, I think it's a nice marriage um, to make communicate. So as we move forward into the next planning session in August, this is something that I think we should take up. Leah, can I ask a question? Yeah. Um, I haven't clicked on the exit survey, but if is that the place to capture ideas for what, like if I thought that I there might be another purpose for this communication subcommittee that's within their purview, is, is that the kind of place to capture it or is that something we should 
yeah. discuss at our last question. work our, at our um, August yes. get together, or so is it something to discuss now? This is, um, I asked our vice chair if he wanted to um, add anything to this survey before we presented it to you, and he thought that this question right here was a good one, and it is basically that. Um, based upon your experience of the year, can you think of any preliminary goals that we should be considering for the next year? So the policy manual, you know, if we all think it's true, we can all put it in there, and then when we get together in August, we can, you know, clearly push that forward. Um, but you know, there's there's a bunch of questions here. Just asking you for your feedback. Okay. Yeah. I I would just add two pieces. One, I think one of our focuses has been to. Um, tighten things up a bit in the manual and instead of having you know three pages of this like here's a link yes. that will send you to this document um, because it just felt like uh, it was kind of hard to digest it all um, and then I also think having Amy and Chandra as part of it was really good because you guys were our more recent members and could kind of look at it from that lens of orientation and say that's not, that was quite my Well, we had some of those conversations, right, or, yeah. Which was really helpful. Or things that we yeah. wanted to emphasize that we thought new members right. might not be clear to them, but they should be very clear on, like, certain policies and things that, that um, they sort of touch on in charting the course, but we wanted to make sure people really paid attention to mm -hmm. around, like, open meeting law and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Which ultimately would be the orientation. Yeah. Okay, great. So those are our standing committees, and um, I believe that kind of captures all of them. So well done, us. Let's move over now to uh, the building committee and your report, Joe. Uh, thank you, Mayor Chairman. I'm sure that you were all uh, immersed in my joint communique I sent out recently regarding the May schedule, but uh, just to reiterate, uh, the building committee will be meeting twice this month. Uh, the first meeting will be on the 17th, our second meeting will be uh, at 6 p.m. on the 31st, which will be followed by a joint meeting with this committee on the 31st for final approval of the schematic design and budget report, but uh, project budget, excuse me. Um, at present, I am expecting that the project budget, the estimated, will be uh, submitting their report. Uh, I was told on the 12th, I'm qualifying that as an honor about date. So, honor about the 12th, we should have. Uh, the report back from the estimates and the compilation of the project budget, or at least a preliminary project budget for review by the committee on the 17th. Uh, as per my communication, which I'm sure you all were immersed in reading, um, we won't have the final figures until we have the, uh, uh, the report back from uh, our geothermal tech on the um, viability of a geothermal heating and uh, cooling system for the high school. Uh, that is on the agenda for the 17th, so I'm assuming that since the agenda is uh, prepared with the assistance of the OPM, that we will be getting those preliminary, uh, we'll get at least some preliminary information back from the geother geothermal tech and consultant on that. Um, other than that, that is it. Uh, as far as our goals are concerned, we are propelling uh, forward towards hopefully approval of this project later this year. If I may, just one thing is just procedural. We typically meet at 7 o'clock for our school board. Oh, yes, I meant to, forgot to mention that. This yes. particular meeting on the My 17th, 17th. we'll be starting at 6 p.m. We have a key member that we're looking to accommodate, so. Oh. <laughs> no, I'm just reading your email. It says 7, so I'm glad that you mentioned it says so Yeah, that was, that was uh, changed after that email. We have, yeah. um, okay. uh, actually, I'll, uh, in the interest of full full disclosure, um, Superintendent Downing has a, um, conflict uh, later that evening so um, I want him there at the meeting for some yeah. important information <laughs> and some important votes so uh, in my discretionary authority I have not given notice to the full committee it is on for 6 p.m. Uh, on the, uh, the 17th it's hard to vote when you're 30,000 feet in the air oh boy yes mm -hmm. okay. um, yeah. well I was gonna say on the 31st the SBC meeting is also at 6 p.m. 6 p.m. followed by a 7 p.m. meeting of the joint. So we that pop-up meeting that we've added on May 31st is 7 p.m. All of the meetings, the remaining meetings of this month are via Zoom. Even though I think that the 24th is marked as being in this room, it's supposed to be Zoom. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah, I just wanted to add on to to 
Joe's report about the building committee and just add some of the work that's been do I've been doing as part of the building committee and the communication um, and engagement outreach subcommittee of the building <laughs> committee, amazing. which is a subcommittee of the school committee. <laughs> Lots of committees going on, but um, just because it is important work that's been happening um, and trying to keep the community informed of the work that of, of what's transpiring within the building committee and that um, the charge of our committee has really been to update the website which somebody I don't know if it's Leah just pulled up so I want to make sure that the community um, knows that this is a living website that's frequently updated to keep people abreast of what's going on and that those meeting dates are on there but I will go in and update the time so that all of us show up at the right the right time but um, it is a really good resource and, and we're trying to um, modify it and, and make it more useful as time goes on. So thanks for that, Amy. Yeah. All right, everyone, we're gonna go over to our advisory committee reports and Maureen is not present today for audit advisory update, but I know that the work is ongoing. Um, anything from DRJ? No report um, on DRJ tonight. They're meeting as we speak. Yeah. Um, I believe they are on the agenda for next week for a report mm -hmm. to the full committee. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, thanks, Sharon. Anything about our from CPAC? CPAC has a meeting scheduled tomorrow evening at 7, I believe, and they will also be joining us, I believe, on the 24th. Is there a okay. report? Awesome. Yes. Can I take the, seize the moment? Sure. And I'll be speaking with Mr. Vine. We'll be engaging with the CPAC in the search for our new director, and that's going to be an important piece. So. Okay. Yeah. I want to make sure Ms. Vine that you join us in that process. Okay, well. thank you. Uh, last advisory is the RACCC, which is on the verge of going away <laughs> because we have two <laughs> town meetings. Uh, two of our town meetings have uh, overwhelmingly approved the amended regional agreement. Stowe is to vote on Saturday. We are Article 41. <laughs> So we're going to buckle up <laughs> right. wow. for that ride. We're very excited. Um, I am hoping, I'm hoping that, I, I'm just joking, oh it's late. Uh, so I'm hoping that this, the town of Stowe sees fit to also approve the amended agreement. If they do, then that amended agreement will become the new regional agreement. And uh, yay, yeah. we did it. And uh, yeah. that's a very good thing. So that is it. Agenda, and I have the planning uh, calendar here. As you guys can see, this is our next regular meeting. It's there. Oh, the okay. credit, credit, and, and the handbook. Mm -hmm. Oh, wait, yeah. starts. Do we have to? No, wait, that's, starts. Well, that's the calendar. That's the calendar. calendar. Because we have to vote to <laughs> amend that one and then vote to approve that one. Yeah. Okay. And then as you guys can see, we have uh, just a little something, something on the 31st here. June 7th is our annual organizational meeting. And like I said, if the regional agreement is approved at, in Stowe, this will be the first meeting of the new committee, which will include a couple of new members, or one new member. One new member. Uh, we have we will have a vacancy um, potentially. Can we not acknowledge that Amy was voted in once again? <gasps> and Sharon was voted in again. Congratulations! Thank you for your service. Um, we so appreciate your willingness to serve all of you. Actually, thank you. Absolutely. Uh, the potential vacancy. Why is it? Potential because somebody could be nobody pulled in. There's a write-in. There might be a write-in candidate. Okay. I was at the town clerk's office today. They said there's a write-in candidate. Interesting. Ah, politics. So um, we will go back to our agenda here, and the only item left is um, a motion to adjourn. So moved. Yes. So okay. All those in favor. At eight fifty-nine. We are adjourning. Oh,